Thank you so much. I'd like to give a very special thanks to all of you in television land and those of you that are present today that have kept my father and mother in your prayers. Thank God for my father as he travels to Birmingham, Alabama today to eulogize a young military veteran, Mr. Bradford, whose father is a military veteran who worked in the Department of Corrections, the father. Today, a mother has lost another son senselessly, a father who was being cared for by his son that was a military man that was accused, not only assassinated in the mall on Thanksgiving Day, but whose character was assassinated after his body was killed by reckless officers in Birmingham. And this has played out across this nation over and over. So I ask that God give my father the strength, maintain his, his, his conviction, and that he gives words of comfort and healing to the family and to the nation. On this day, December 1st, 1955, we know our history and I ask those in television land, let's not fix the blame, let's fix the problem. Our school system isn't teaching our children their history and their courageousness. Take a moment and tune in so we can have our children sitting in front of the television so we can take them into a civics lesson. Our children should go to school Monday through Friday. They should have an after-school program. They need to tune in to a civics program at Rainbow Push, and by all means, you need to get your children to a Sunday school program every Sunday. I want to thank a friend and brother, Brother Dr. Stephen Ray of the Chicago the Theological Seminary and all of those faculty members and persons that have come out today from CTS. Uh, they have no idea how they blessed me this morning. It was a group that I felt so comfortable with. These were my friends and family, and Dr. Ray has no idea that he was able to give me an enormous gift today by helping me have a better understanding and positioning who my father is to so many others. When people ask me about the Reverend Jesse Jackson, I have to say, are you talking about dad? I've had the benefit of being up close. I can't measure him from afar. And for the little baby that's crying in here today, please let that baby stay. That baby is welcome. I love to hear the sound of the children. Some people have the strength to get out of bed and they won't. Some people have a car with gas in it and they won't do anything but go for their own selves. Some people have the money to take a taxi and a limo, but they have no interest in freedom. Now you see that baby stop crying because the baby knows it's the truth. <laughs> On this day, December 1st, 1955, a young man that was bold and filled with the spirit, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, I would say that he did something that changed the trajectory of American history. Far too often I hear about Reverend Martin Luther King. They don't even call him Reverend Martin Luther King, Dr. Ray. As I drive around the country and I see the street exits, I see Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard. I see Dr. M.L. King. I see M.L. King. Even at the statue in Washington, D.C., you do not see the Reverend Martin Luther King. Well, let us have a quick lesson on grammar. Your highest salutation should be most prominent. If you were once a bishop and now you become the Pope, henceforth and evermore you are called the Pope because that is a higher salutation than the bishop. If you were a senator and now go on to become the President of the United States, you will be properly regarded as the former President of the United States of America. Having your doctoral dissertation, writing a paper, is only a function of what your higher calling is. To be a minister, to have a vocal, a calling from God, the reverend comes before the doctor. It's a higher calling. And we are proud of the name of the Reverend Martin Luther King. 
Let our children remember that. On this day of December 1st, 1955, in my comments today, I want to talk about the third force that the Chicago Theological Seminary has been committed to. The third force in the Chicago Theological Seminary. I had to change my remarks around this morning. I'm on the edge all night trying to get my last remarks together to be relevant and timely. And so I wake up and see the morning news to see if something has changed. I try to keep up with the wildfires in California, and then the mudslides, and then the, then the, the flash, fl and then the earthquakes in the Anchorage, Alaska, because they're taking too much oil out of the ground, and then the mass killings that are happening in our neighborhoods. I want to stay on the cutting edge so I can have a message that's comfortable to you, that's timely so you can stay up so you don't put me to sleep. But now I want to take two steps back on the third force. On the big picture, young people, our people came to these shores in 1619. Just 400 years ago, come 16, come 2019, we will be celebrating 400 years in the Americans as Americans. Some persons might have thought you were the descendants of slaves. I don't have any slave ancestry. I was a child of God. My father's a child of God. My grandmother, my great, great, great are children of God. You ain't going to put that on me. And my lineage has always been to fight against oppression. Some people have succumbed. You're a slave when you give up and you have no fight. Reverend Brother Nelson Mandela said he was freed behind the bars because he was fighting for a purpose. Chains and shackles don't make you a slave. You can have the chains and the shackles off like Dr. Benjamin, like Dr. Carter G. Woodson taught you, and you'll still be a slave because you won't want to go in the front door. You'll find the back door, and where there is no door, you'll cut a hole. We're not going to blame the school system. We're going to teach our own children how to read. Don't go to school cursing out a teacher. And you got 500 channels on in your house, and there's never a quiet moment for the child to read. 1619 to 2019, 400 years. The good part is I'm going to get you through this in two minutes. You ain't going to be stuck 400 years ago. We're going forward. What did Reverend Martin Luther King do? What does this have to do with the Chicago Theological Seminary and where we're going to land today in 2018? Well, in 1619, some people had to put the law with religion in order to create a slave consciousness. Some people had to make themselves feel superior and at the same time justify it theologically to make others feel inferior. When the cross gets wed with the law book, now you've got a wholly unmatrimonious relationship. It was, it was 1955 on this day when the Reverend Martin Luther King did something big a young man that was being lured and wanted to go into academia. He could have had a big church. He could have had what they call a mega church. I guess that means where there are a lot of people. He didn't want to see a mega church. Reverend Martin Luther King wanted to see the mass of Christ. He wanted to see 50,000 people in Birmingham moving in love taking an old slaveocracy off of their back. If you don't want someone to ride your back, just stand up and they will fall off. So from 1619 to 8 to 1955, 336 years, God blessed a child whose father, Daddy King, was a minister who had to go back to school, this is a point for somebody, 
Stop telling your child to go to school when you need to go back to school. <laughs> Daddy King from Stockbridge, Georgia, had to work in the farm and in the fields, didn't have glasses and couldn't read, wanted to make, a, wanted to have a courtship with Mrs. King down in, um, at Dexter Avenue Baptist, at, at Dexter Avenue, no, no, that's that church, not Dexter Avenue, that's in Montgomery. What's his church in Atlanta? Ebenezer. He wanted to court Martin Luther King's father, but he couldn't read. She was the daughter of a prominent minister, so he went back to school to make himself worthy. Step up your game, young people. You want to have a date? Take somebody to the library. You want to have a date? Meet somebody at school. You want to have a date? Come on, y'all. It was 336 years from 1619 to 1955 that God blessed a child whose parents, the great, great grandson of those that had been born into slavery that were called less than human. He put this spirit in the mind of a child to give us what I would call a spiritual technology. He took us out of the stained glass walls and he made our religion move. He put our religion on wheels. This wasn't about a seat on the bus, the front of the bus, the back of the bus, around the bus, you pay on the bus, step off to get off to the back, then the bus driver closes the door and he leaves you. Somebody comes in, you have to stand up and get up and leave. No, no. This was about the dignity of a human being. After 336 years, he wanted us to see. We needed to be the bus drivers. We needed to be able to sell the tires to the bus. We needed to be the mechanics for the bus. We needed to be the leasing agents for the bus. We needed to be able to sell the insurance to the bus. This was us talking about a transit system. I know you've heard you are what you eat. Brothers and sisters, that's true. But more importantly, you are where you live. What do I mean you are where you live? And you, your life expectancy is now limited to zip codes. The acronym ZIP, Z-I-P, stands for the Zone Improvement Plan. Jim Crow has grown up and has gone into marketing and has become digitized, has become Wi-Fi, and also has WiMAX. You are limited to your opportunities in this country based on your zip codes. The wealthiest neighborhoods have access to great transportation. The poorest neighborhoods have been cut off from mass transit systems. Look right here in the city of Chicago. We have three mass transit systems and one transfer doesn't get you across all three lines. Martin Luther King fought for something so much bigger than a bus seat. He was talking about a transit system that isolated and segregated and separated God's children. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, from the time slavery had officially been abolished in 1865 until 1965, when we had secured the Voting Rights Act, Reverend Martin Luther King's speech was about our right to vote in 1863 to 1963. That message he gave on the hills, on the footsteps of the Washington Monument was about, Lincoln, you promised us. And we come to redeem a check that you have returned that says insufficient funds. Now, what does that have to do with 2018? When we see the elections being stolen in Florida with Brother Gilliam, when we see the elections being stolen in Georgia with Sister Abrams, when we see the outright racism and hostility in Mississippi, we understand what it means to have your vote nullified. This is why I'm so excited today about having the Chicago Theological Seminary with us and Dr. Stephen Ray and our own Reverend Dr. Jeanette Wilson. Somebody has to speak truth to power. 
Now, I know you say, Jonathan, you started in 1619. I'm getting tired. Well, Sir Isaac Newton in 1666 came up with these principles of the laws of gravitation. And he said there were three laws. I want to focus as I conclude on the one law that's pertinent to us right now. His first law of gravitation was a body will continue to go in a downward motion unless an external force acts upon it to correct it. In conclusion, this young man, the Reverend Martin Luther King, the Reverend Martin Luther King, the Reverend Martin Luther King was an external force used and created by God to challenge a segregation system that was on a downward trajectory. We're not a great country until all people are recognized as human beings. The first law of gravity, if it's relevant in 1666, and it's relevant today to understand it, not purely from a physics, but from a spiritual context. Who goes into the public square and teaches and preaches truth to power? That's not the businessman. The business is about a zero-sum game. How do I win and how do you lose? That's not the politics. What do I get versus what you get? Somebody's got to be bigger than that. That's the role of the preacher. That's the role of God's hand, the external force that corrects the wrong. Where are we today? In 2018, as our president and world leaders are at the G20 in Buenos Aires, as we talk about a world where technology is impacting every single industry that we can think about. There are 3.6 million Americans now, Reverend Stevens, that have a college degree that are living in poverty. 12% of those that went to college are living in poverty. Don't get me wrong, finish school. I know some people are going to be too smart for their britches. That's not what he said. He said you should not go to school. You need to have your skills in the meantime, before you make up your mind on what you want to do, stay in school, go with what's tried and true. The external factors that are happening. Technology is displacing so many. When we see that um, Amazon promising $15 an hour in wages and jobs, most people need to work, have two full-time minimum wage jobs in order to make one, one standard living. We're going to need an external force. Rainbow Push looks forward to the work we're going to be doing with the Chicago Theological Seminary, going out into the world. Our children need to understand the value of the ministers. Ministers have been degraded and have been talked about, but I don't see another way to fix the problem until we have a cultural character revolution. Look at what the world has applauded. If you think, if you want to know what God thinks about money, look at who he gives it to. Our president may have a 757. He may have a limousine. Do you think there's a place in heaven for this man right now? But the good Lord can use the jawbone of a jackass to get done what he wants to get done when he wants to get it done. Look at what the good Lord gives to those that have money. One day they're not going to be able to spend that money. One day you're not going to be able to give Putin in a condo. One day you're not going to be able to steal no more. God still reigns supreme. There's an external factor that our children have to understand. It's not just about your net worth. What about some self-worth? What have you done for others? What have you done that makes your life matter? And I thank God for continuing to give my father the strength, and I hope that he comes back soon to his rightful place, and tis the season to be jolly, joy to the world.